the radio man is here. I know you were there. How do you feel? You're following the political process in Nigeria. You're following the discussion, the politics of time. My name is Edmond Obilo. Welcome to this day's edition of State Affairs. And what am I looking at? The military in politics. At what time did the northernization of Nigeria's military began? What are the effects of the northernization of Nigeria's military? How will it affect the politics of 2023? If you look at the interview granted to Channel's television by Rabi Ukwakonso, a former governor of, Kad of Kano State, you would see the question of ethnic politics at play. Remember, he is the presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party. He makes the point clearly. Can we devolve ethnic politics out of this system? Is it Paul? Will Peter Obi be seen as an Igbo candidate and Bola Ahmed Tinubu a Yoruba candidate? What about the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party? Is he a Fulani candidate? We will walk down history lane to see how the military was able to enable ethnic politics. And as we speak, nothing has really changed. Before diving fully into the subject, I make the point that Nigeria needs education revolution. Every child should attend school. Not giving a child good education is a crime, a crime against humanity, and the Nigerian state continues to commit this crime. There are millions of uneducated children roaming our streets. We need to solve that problem. Solving that problem is solving the problems of poverty. Producing citizens driven by knowledge is essential to Nigeria attaining an advanced status. Nigeria's foundation was laid on the premise of suspicion between the North and the South. It was pursued of the colonialists. After October 1st, 1960, when the country got her independence, it was expected that Nigeria would rally its people and draft policies geared towards development. But the country began a fall into the old traditional frontiers that has continued to divide it. These frontiers are ethnic and religious fragments. You talk of nepotism and corruption, injustice, human rights violation. And when you talk about nepotism, some would argue that the present president of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari, a representation of nepotistic politics. And let me say to you listening to me, that things have never been this bad, especially with regard to electricity in Nigeria. It is so poor at the moment. Insecurity, it's at the maximum height. So sometimes when I look at the All Progressives Congress, I ask, what would the APC be telling Nigerians? 
after seven years of Buhari's poor performances in different sectors of the economy. The one that breaks my heart most is the poor electricity supply. For seven years, Buhari cannot find solution to that problem. And Buhari is a representation of that military character that the radio man is talking about this afternoon. I'm happy you're joining this broadcast. Tell your friends that the radio man is here. Call your neighbors. And how do you do that? You help share the video. We are broadcasting on Twitter. So if you are on Twitter, I'm happy to have you. The radio man is now on Twitter. We are streaming on Twitter. If LinkedIn is your choice, if you are on LinkedIn, the radio man is on LinkedIn this afternoon. We are broadcasting from Ibadan. That is where the radio man is at the moment. So we are streaming on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. We are streaming on YouTube. Search for Edmondo Bilo on YouTube. Remember to subscribe to the channel. So tell your friends, we are there. It's about history. We are walking the history lane. Looking back into time, perhaps some would say, Gan to beat us. So I've talked about the frontiers of ethnicity, the frontiers of religion, issues holding down the development of Nigeria. Let's bring in Yinka Udumaki at this point into the discourse. Yinka Udumaki of blessed memory. Before he died, he told me that Nigeria is at that point that he described as quarter to midnight. Let's reflect on the point Yinka makes. And he also talks about ethnicity. Yinka Odumaki of Blessed Memory on State Affairs. Uh, at three today, it's quarter to midnight in Nigeria. You know, in the United Nations, there's what's called disaster the clock. When the country is under stress, when it gets to a boiling point, they say that country is at the quarter to midnight. Nigeria today is at the quarter to midnight. And the only way this cock this cock can pass over us is to restructure Nigeria. Otherwise, let me not see what the options are. State Affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. Here we go. State Affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. Stay tuned. Uh, Mr. Dumakin, you would agree with me that the discussion of this subject is taking ethnic dimension. And yeah. you want to ask, when are we going to stop talking about ethnicity when issues arise? When the world ends. When the world ends? Yes, because ethnicity is the reality of life. Go into, your Bible, into the Bible. Twelve tribes of Israel. Why not from the father? But there are tribes. In every decision, every tribe bring a man. These are the realities of our life. Nigeria is a salad bowl society. When you take a bowl of salad, you can see all the ingredients. This lettuce, this tomato, this carrot, this egg. It's a combination of all these ingredients that gives you what is called salad. Nigeria is never going to become a melting pot because God who created us with different identities knows why he did so. And nobody can raise that out of, that of life. Do you subscribe to that idea enunciated by Yinka Odumaki of Blessed Memory? You leave your comments under the streaming platforms. 
If you are on Twitter and you are watching the radio, man, do you agree with what Yinkao Dumakin said there? And there's nothing we can do about ethnic politics. It has come to stay. Peter Obi Igbo. Bola Ahmed Tinubu Yoruba. Atiku Abubaka Fulani. Is that what would determine who becomes the next president? Or is it that Nigerians are ready to redefine it? The ball is always in the court of the people. If the writings of scholars like Ali Ali Mazrui and Kegreen are anything to go by, by preserving northern Nigeria, especially as an area of cultural autonomy with its own strong institutions, Britain inadvertently contributed to the forces that culminated in the Nigerian Civil War. This deepening regionalism and the manifest contradictions in the regional system, according to some scholars, constituted the most damaging legacy of colonial rule. If you can lay your hands on some of the writings of Shawood Smith, in this case I'm referring to his 1969 seminal work, he insists that the British had no choice but to maintain the North's decisive numerical advantage as it was the sole defense against political and economic domination by the South. Look at that point. You know, in the discourse of the moment, some are saying Peter Obi cannot be president until he penetrates the North. The votes coming from Kanu and Katsina alone swallows the votes coming from the Southeast. How did we get to that point? Was it a deliberate plot from the beginning? Sherwood Smith, in his 1969 work, insists that the British had no choice but to maintain the not decisive numerical advantage as it was the sole defense against political and economic domination by the South, and the South was more educated and innovative. So to balance it, the colonialists said, okay, perhaps we give them more numbers, and that will balance the innovation and education of the South. Where has that led Nigeria? at the moment where the reason i think you should read a book what britain did to nigeria look at this book what britain did to nigeria i am not quoting from this book but if you read this book you would see a similar argument to what shout smith is saying in my script so if you are interested in this book, visit our bookstore, udarabooks.com, udarabooks.com, and you can get a copy of this book. And this is straight from the publisher, a quality publication. This is hardcover. The author's book is Mark Sulin, What Britain Did to Nigeria, A Short History of Conquest and rule read this book and you will develop new perspectives about where we are or it will emphasize your idea of where we are remember the program is state affairs with the radio man we are streaming on all social media platforms popular in Nigeria, except Instagram. Haven't quoted from Sherwood Smith's work, it is important we take the argument further. Remember, non-Nigeria was one entity. Why the South was divided into East and West and Mid-West? It was one North 
But for the south, it was divided into west, east, and mid-west. And that gave the so-called monolithic north advantage over the orders in the parliamentary time. The reason Tafawa Balewa, a member of the MPC, became the prime minister. According to critics, one consequence of this British action is that the whole nation never benefited from a fuller social integration options of the country. In this analysis, Odia Ofimu, the author of the book Taking Nigeria Seriously, explains the political The NCNC Igbo fraction was told if action group, you will be struggling with people who already have everything that you have. It will be a great struggle. So why not build up your coalition with the North? Before 1960, Nigeria was quite a conglomerate. We knew which area was where. We had homelands and people defended their homelands in various ways. We wondered how the homelands could become cross-cutting environments for the defense of our freedom. But that period passed, and the competition between the homelands became value and core reality of our politics. It is always good never to forget that it is the centrality of that, that competition to the Nigerian force fields that has ensured nothing else will work here. Because the nature of the Morganatic marriage, the kind of dead marriage that was built for Nigeria, ensured that we would never, we would never have a level playing field unless we created it. If there was a geographical expression we needed to set out what would turn that geographical expression into a cultural expression. Aurora did attempt it to spell out what and what needed to be done for the geography to become a cultural expression. But because he was usually beaten out of it, either by his opponents or by internal fractions within his own party, what needed to be done, done always 
overreached the rest of us. We never managed to hold on to it. I want us never to forget that at independence, it was a struggle between three regions, each dominated by a major ethnic group that organized a major political party, had an opposition that was based on a minority seeking freedom for themselves within the freedom that the rest of Nigeria was angling for. It is important that we never forget this. And the resolution that came was two of the three regions banding together to determine how the third would be excluded. People have forgotten what actually happened. And when you read the books, it is not played up enough. The point is, the NCNC Igbo fraction was told, if you form a coalition with the action group, you will be struggling with people who already have everything that you have. It will be a great struggle. So why not build up your coalition with the North so that you can take all the jobs that the North would not have the manpower to a perfect arrangement. If you, if you follow Chino Achebe's book, There Was a Country, he actually talks very glowingly about how the Igbo people became dominant. They become, it became dominant because as a result of that agreement they reached, the Igbo people could take over, could take over all the jobs in the system. And they did. But by 1964, they discovered that the iron and steel industry, military installations, the railway extensions, the Kainji Dam, and then the steel industry, which had already been, been slated for Onicha, now became something that would go again to the north. It was at that point that an election took place in 64. And Nam Azikwe refused to call Balewa to form a government. And it was on the day that this was properly exposed that Ojuku first went to Nam Azikwe in 1964 to say, let's plan a coup. Zik was too frightened of a coup, and he ran away. But Baliba had taken the line that would become the determinant of all other things. He simply sent the soldiers to seize the state house and put the president under court study. When Nigeria's story is being told, nobody tells the story so well as to let us know that that was the first military coup in Nigeria's history. When Unamdi Azikwe, we, after having published a speech in his own West African parallel saying, I won't invite you to form a government, decided to write another at the, before evening, calling them to form a government. If you are thinking of how to deal with the Buhari situation, just remember, the unitarism that came after the coup was from an NCNC script. The unitarism that displaced the NCNC script was an Arawa script. What the Arawa people have tried to do ever since is not only to take over the country, but to change the society in such a manner that becomes malleable in their interest. State Affairs with Edmond Nobilo is live. Stay tuned. Uh, Mr. Dumakin, you would agree with me that the discussion of this subject is taking ethnic dimension. And yeah. you want to ask, when are we going to stop talking about ethnicity when issues arise? When the world ends. When the world ends? Yes, because... Ethnicity is the reality of life. Go into your Bible, into the Bible. Twelve tribes of Israel. Why not for the father? But their tribes. In every decision, every tribe bring a man. These are the reality of our life. Nigeria is a salad bowl society. When you take a bowl of salad, you can see all the ingredients. This lettuce, this tomato, this carrot. This egg is the ingredients that gives you what is called salad. Nigeria is never going to become a melting pot because who created us with different identities knows why it did so. 
and nobody can raise that of, that out of life. Yes, you listen to Odia Ofemu there, giving a breakdown in 1964, giving insight into Nigeria's ethnic politics. And Yinkao Duma King of Blessed Mary confirms that ethnicity has come to stay. How far will ethnicity go in determining who becomes Nigeria's next president? What Odiao Femu referred to as the first coup in Nigeria was the failure of Namdi Azikiwe to rally the military to his side during the 1964 election crisis. In the battle of supremacy with the Prime Minister Tafawa Baliwa, Zik had thought that as the president of the Nigerian state and commander-in-chief, the military would take orders from him. The military did not. This was not to be as the then colonial head of the army, Major General Welby Everard, was legally advised to take orders from Tafawa Baliwa, and this forced Namdi Azikiwe to renege on his well-published stance that he would not call on Baliwa to form a new government after the severely flawed 1964 election. The flawed 1965 regional election in western Nigeria proved to be the catalyst that brought the military out of the barracks. about the situation. What Kaduna Nzogu did in that speech was to attack those that seek to keep the country divided permanently so that they can remain in office as ministers or VIPs. Nzogu condemned the tribalists of the time, the nepotists, those that make country the country look big for nothing before the international community. Zogu blamed them for corrupting society by their words and deeds. So what did he do? Zogu in the speech 
promised law-abiding Nigerians freedom from and all forms of oppression. In his words, we promise that you will no more be ashamed to say you are a Nigerian. Has anything changed? The promise of freedom did not come as the military found itself in crisis. Crisis that snowballed into a civil war. The war followed the bloody counter coup of 29th July 1966, and that coup was led by mostly northern officers. Chief Tola Adini talks about Kaduna Nzogu in this interview. I was asking him, Chief Adini, you are a veteran journalist. How come you went that far to celebrate Kaduna Nzogu? Let's hear from Tola Adini. You were so bold as to name a street after Kaduna Nzogu. Yes, they didn't, they didn't allow it. The chairman of the council at that time, one Mr. Abasi, was afraid. He was the chairman of the council. He said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't handle this. So he went to Jembe, who was the governor. I can't somebody name a street after Nzogu. What was wrong with Nzogu? Exactly. So Did I you ask her? Had my way. I, I, just, uh, I put the name there. It was there. Chukuma Nzogu Crescent. You left it there? Yes. It's still there? Yes, Chukuma Nzogu Crescent. You like him? Of course. I went to Okwanami in 1970 to meet his mother. He killed Amadou Bello. Why should you like him? Oh, come on. The man staged a, a beautiful coup. Beautiful? Yeah. It doesn't Can matter. a coup be beautiful? Of course. That would, they, 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 they do, they do, they do regime, regime change all over the world. They do regime change all over the world. But that coup led to a devastation, the civil war. It was not well handled. If Zegu had been lucky to be the, the president or the head of state, it would go the other way. It would go be the other way. We would have massacred the leaders. No. Left. Well, Rollins massacred leaders. Uh, Mengistu El Mariam in Ethiopia massacred leaders. But never say, solved the problem of Ethiopia and Ghana, did it? Ghana is a better place than it was before Rollins. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Certainly, yes. Ghana is. No, no, no government official in Ghana would dare steal the way they are still in Nigeria now. No blood. They won't dare. They will not dare. Listening to Chief Tola Dini, a veteran journalist, talking about Kaduna and Zogu. What are you saying? Let's see. Oscar Izzy says he's watching from Manchen in Germany, the one we call Munich, Bayern Manchen. All right, Izzy, thank you for listening. Uluwatu Mishi says, please work on your sound. Yes. They're having some technical challenges, but I think we've resolved that. Kola De Mudashiru says, ethnicity plays major roles in Nigeria, starting from the pre-colonial era. Yes, I agree with you, Kola De Mudashiru. Kenechi Okpara is saying, who is talking about Shore? Who is one of the people that brought us this calamity administration? You want to blame Shore for that? I don't think that will be fair to him. Shore has contributed to elevating this country from this doldrum. You might disagree with some of his methods, but history will favor the young man at some point. He has fought battles, he has stood up to this government, and he is in the running for the office of the president. Come 2023. I wish Omoyele Shore well. Though Peter Obi is dominating the scene at the moment, but one question this program is raising How will ethnicity determine who becomes the next president of Nigeria? Military officers, mostly of Igbo extraction, were killed in the counter coup 
of July 1966, and it was an apparent resolution of the, of the January coup carried out by mostly Igbo officers. The coups came with vengeance, hate, ethnicity, religion, and corruption. Building the state on these doctrines, as the military did, was the danger that took the country through the roads of underdevelopment and discontent. When Kaduna Nzogu and his collaborators struck in 1966, the Nigerian state was jotted to the belief that a new dance meant for the goodness of the people. This was not to be as the coup was hijacked by the head of the army, General Agui Ironsi. Remember Ironsi? Ironsi was killed in the July 1966 coup. Apparently, he was killed for not dealing decisively with the January coup plotters, the coup that aborted the First Republic. The North was angry with Ironsi for turning the country into a unitary state from its previous federal arrangement. That's another development. It was Ironsi that moved Nigeria from federalism to a unitary system. And he is an Igbo man. Today, many Igbo youths are saying no, they will not accept the present Nigeria the way it is structured. You can see the picture of Ironsi on the screen. Ironsi, the first military head of state in Nigeria. You see him there? That was the man that was killed by northern officers in the July coup of 1966. Yakubu Gowon became military head of state after Ironsi was killed. Yakubu Gowon was installed by the northern officers who avenged the January coup. I have been looking for a work that defines Ironsi. And happily, I am announcing to you that there is a book entitled Ironsi, Nigeria, the Army, Power and Politics. This book is written, this book is written by Chooks Ilwe Bunam you need to read this book. I recommend this book to you if you are interested in Nigerian politics. I am telling you as a political scientist that the 2023 election will throw up ethnic dust. It has just started. Who conquers the day? Peter will be for now seems to be the pan-Nigerian in this contest. And I'm defining that in terms of his followership as represented in the media. Bola Ahmed Tinubu, yes, is pan-Nigerian, no doubt. The contest has just begun. If you feel that Peter Obi fans and followers will bully the Tinubu followers just like that, the game has just begun. The knot has a way of playing its politics. Reading this book will help you interpret what will happen. Ironsi, Nigeria, the army, power and politics. If you are interested in a copy, contact Udara Books. We will be uploading it on the website later in the day. These are some of the new collections we are bringing in. So go on udarabooks.com. And Will will get you this book about Ironsi. The radio man is here. Let's see who is talking. Ade Dayo Akere Dulu is watching. Ochuko John Dal BMT is watching on Facebook. Ugo Maduka, Ugo, how are you? What are you saying about the situation of the country? And I want to read them. Olanio Itunu says he's watching from Northampton in the United Kingdom. John Kennedy Chinedu said, play. Okay, I can get that. 
Adekule Jobe is watching from London. John Kennedy, they will say, why not go back to the regional structure? Does the candidacy of Peter Obi, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, and Atiku Abubakar represent that regional structure? Remember, Nigeria was built on a tripod. The north, the east, and the west. But today has become the north-south dichotomy. Who is talking about the Midwest? Now a do and Delta. Who is even talking about the North Central? Sometimes as if they are not part of the equation. When they say the North will not vote Peter Obi, you begin to ask, is Benue still part of the North? Plateau State? In Kaduna, you have Kaduna North, Kaduna South. And you have the Christians there. Bauchi has a very large Christian population. Anyway, as we go, we we'll begin to make a breakdown of the likely scenarios as the politics of the moment expands. Remember, call on your friends to watch us. I mean on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, you can subscribe to my channel. Search for Edmondo Bilo. We are streaming on LinkedIn. Are you on LinkedIn? You can find me there. If you are on Twitter, you can tweet at me. You can follow me on Twitter. And we are also streaming on Twitter. Just search for Edmond Abilo on Twitter. And you can leave your comments there. You can retweet our broadcast on Twitter. And remember, you can always visit Udara Books for books on politics. We mostly deal on books on politics. And the essence is to educate the learner, to broaden our horizon, our ideas of leadership. And that has to do with educating the mind. Reading is a powerful tool for change. It creates new understanding. It creates new meanings of things and time. Remember... You can use our studios for your event. Prodigy Studios. Visit Prodigy Studios for your documentaries. You have events, conferences. You want to cover your wedding. Yemi Prodigy is on ground to help you get quality production. That's the reason you should visit Prodigy Studios. For photography and videos. Where is Prodigy Studios? You know Akala Express? Akala Express, new garage. Just drive down. You come very close to the fellows. Leure bus stop on Akala Express. You look for Amheri Hotel. So, you'll find Prodigy Studios. After NMPC petrol station on your right, you drive down. There is a roundabout. Just keep moving. As you move, keep looking right. You will see the big signpost on a story building, Prodigy Studios. We are waiting for you. Remember, you can call Prodigy Studios on 080-70-73-970. You can also call 080-664-664. 62245. So we are waiting for you at Prodigy's Studios. Yes, talking about military in politics. Talking about Yakubu Gowon. After the July coup, the northern officers that executed the coup installed their man, Yakubu Gowon, as the military head of state. And that was after Ironsi was killed. The emergence of Gowon distorted the question of seniority in the army. After Ironsi's death, the like of Lieutenant Colonel Odumegu Ujuku 
expected Brigadier Baba Femi Ogundikbe, a Yoruba man and the most senior officer at the time to take over. But Northern officers would have none of that. They would not take order from Baba Femi Ogundikbe, who was a Brigadier General. They would only take orders from a Northern officer. And Baba Femi Ogundikbe had on the ship. He ran out of the country for fear of his life, and Gowan was unstored. With Ogundikbe out of the picture, it became a Herculean task to convince Chukwemeka Odumegu Wojuku, the then military governor of the opportunity came for Ogundikbe. He was overlooked again because it was felt he would not be able to control soldiers from the north who were not ready to take orders from him. Now, I want us to listen to this interview. I had to discuss the subject. The army at the beginning with Major Razaki Salau. So here, we talked about Ojuku and the coup. Just Salau retired. On state affairs. Queen's own Nigerian regiment, that was the army used to be. Mm. And that Queen's own Nigerian regiment, which means we are still part of a, a British uh, a army yeah. or under the British it colony. colonial army. Okay, that colony, it's this colonial army. In fact, I joined NMF, Nigerian Military Force. Nigerian Military Force. They didn't call it Nigerian Army at that time. Mm. They didn't call it Nigerian Army. They call it Nigerian Military Force. And that is what behind my number up to today. NMF, Nigeria Military Force. So it was Colonial Army. But and you, you, you trained with Ujuku when you joined? In, in Zaria, the same day we were trained at Mobolaji Johnson. Zaria. When we, you see, Ujuku and Mobolaji Johnson were recruited. So we have the same recruitment exercise. They recruited them from Lagos. They recruited us from Ibadan. In fact, they put us, the train that was coming bringing Ujuku and Mobolaji Johnson from Ibadan stopped at Dubia. This is the same Dubai mm. here in 1957, September 21, precisely. September 21, precisely. And they carry those of us who are recruited from Ibadan. And at this time, we have people from Midwest. They don't call them Midwest at that time. No, thing like Delta. It was Western region. So it was that time we met Ojuku inside the, inside the train, first class. The rest of us were in the second, whether they call it economic class or so, we met him there. So he was actually playing with us that what do we want to go and do in the army and so on and so forth? We were joking. Myself and Mobolaji become tight friends because we are good athletes. Oh. Uh, we are good athletes. And we play, you know, seriously when we were in Zaria. In fact, that's what made me to become member of the Jogarubas basketball team. So what did you have see in Ojuku in 1957 during the training? You see, uh, the, the training actually was not completely uh, part of our own type of training. His own training was short-lived. Why? Because he was trained basically as somebody who will become an officer. So his own training had carried more advanced lecture, advanced lesson, preparing him to go to UK. He was already a graduate at that he time. He was already a graduate. He was already a, a, a product of Oxford University. We are some of us who are actually playing with uh, school art, modern three, and the rest of that. So, our own training was more rigorous than his own. It was followed with Oyibos, white men, more than our own. Mm. Our own, we have white men with us, but Africans, African instructors were more on our own side. And uh, the, the, the brutality of the training on our own side was more serious than that of his own. So, the respect that was going to become an officer actually was adorned him mm. at that time. But then, he never left us behind. He's always around us after the training. Say, Rasaki, how are you? And so on and so forth. We will go and go do the games together. And was so he playful? So. Was he jovial? He, was he stubborn? Ojuku, Ojuku was, uh, was, a, was a nice man to us. He was, he was very nice. But what you see in Ojuku is that it's highly reserved. Highly reserved. What do you mean by being highly What I mean reserved? by highly reserved is that when we are joking, talking about our families, uh, an Igbo man will be talking about Harujuku, I'll be talking about Ibadan, Ikiri, and so on and so forth. 
somebody from um, Edo will be talking about Tauchi, Ora, and so on. Oju will be talking about Lagos. Because Oju could speak English, I mean Yoruba language, more than me. He speaks Yoruba language very, very fluently. You know, he gives you the proverb, he gives you an example, he tells the history about the Yorubas. So, you know, what else do you want from a person? That, so, that's endeared to him. He hear, he, he's an Igbo man, he hears Hausa, he hears uh, Yoruba. So, by the time we are joking or talking or playing games and the rest of that, you see him actually attending to you with your own language. So, uh, that's what endeared him, uh, us to him. By so, the time you joined the army in 1957, yes. there was the Nigerianization policy at that time, right? There was Nigerianization policy. At what point did we have Northernization policy? Hmm. I tell you, Northernization policy came before Nigerianization policy. Can you tell me more? The, 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 the reason for that, the reason for that is what you are seeing today politically. Unless you are not in Nigeria, you will not, we say there is no Northernization policy that is still existing. What is affecting you today that is affecting me is first and foremost Nigerianization policy. And you saw that when you joined the oh, army? We, we, we never knew. Innocent people. We saw the army in uniform and that's all we knew. And the, the uh, we, we, white men and so on and so forth. You, by the time we joined the army, you know, um, uh, the bombings, the Ghanaians, the Cameroonians, people from Tanzania, we are in the same, we are in the same uh, unit together. Working together, in together, dancing together, do everything together. So you hardly know which one is Nigerian. But that policy started long before that time. Taking your mind back now, what did you experience? When you look at the state creation in Nigeria today, state creation in Nigeria today, the political appointment in Nigeria today, even the public service today, you will not doubt that it Northernization policy is still there. So at that time, were there more Northern officers recruited during your time? Many of them. Why well, learned that the, main, the officers were majorly Igbo officers? Why I say many of them, why I say many of them is this. High-ranking officers were many. Mm. Other rank officers, I mean, lower-rank officers were majorly Igbos. In fact, the least uh, enlisted army officers came from the Yoruba land, from Western, from Western at that time. But you see, our own knowledge at that time did not attack politics to the service. Our way is to serve. But before we realized this issue of, you know, acquiring, one particular section of the army was acquiring larger number, one was acquiring the lower number, it was during the first coup when the explanation came in the air. I became fully aware. We became conscious of, I mean, is that what has been happening? Is this what we are benefiting from or, you know, losing? That was during the first coup that took place in 1966. That was January 15. That was January 15, 1966, when um, uh, Kaduna in Zeogu came up and started to explain us no, in details, in the newspaper, on radio, and the rest of that. In fact, that is where the minds of the rest of us were brought to a situation to say, okay, now in my unit. You were in of, Kaduna at the time. I was in Kaduna. I was in Kaduna. I served the longest time in the military in Kaduna, though my last unit was in Lagos, where I retired finally, after returning from the United States. Mm. It was in Lagos. But in Kaduna, in Kaduna that time. In fact, it, the, Kaduna is the home of the military. Let me, I don't, for it is the home of the military. There is no unit you can, don't, don't find in Kaduna. In fact, when all that region were having just one battalion, Kaduna had two. They have the artillery, they have the reconnaissance, they have a military hospital. Why? Well, well, I'm telling you that it was when Kaduna and Ziogu came up with his, his broadcast during the war. I mean, just before the war that led to the war, according to them, the cool that, speech, the, yeah, the cool speech that we knew, that we became conscious of what was happening at that time. However, that does not move us young soldiers. What we know is that we are to serve, and we were serving. Look, look back, 
and to see whether something was, whether there was Nigerianization, whether there was Nigerianization. But Nigerianization was meant for Nigerians to replace the white people. And that is clearly understood. So any enlisted officer at that time, all we believe is that going to replace Mr. Jack, Mr. John, Mr. Saville, Mr. This and That, we know that. That even during that time, we have what they call non commissioned officers, NCO, sergeant, staff sergeant, warrant officer in Nigerian Army. Many of them, there were even many, more than that of Nigeria. Mr. So, Salah, you know, yes. was that was the January coup a surprise coup? Did you expect it as a young military officer? As a matter of fact, let you know that the focus of a soldier, of our own type of soldier at that time, it was a big surprise to us. A surprise? It was a surprise to us. Because discussing, you know, generally about the coup, we were wondering what would have led to the coup. Because we are sealed up in the barracks. Our outside communication with the civilian populace or civilian community was little because within the barracks you have whatever, whatever you want to have. So what are you going to do outside? So we are completely isolated from politics. Except when you come on leave, you start to hear, uh, this is what they are doing, you know, this is what, and we turn deaf ear to that type of thing because the, what they have injected into our blood is service. Service to the nation. And they, we, have, we have been told that Nigeria is divided into three zones, three regions, east, west, and north. So the issue of whether one area is larger or is, uh, is, is at advantage, very, very strange to us. What did that coup do to the military? Well, the coup, the coup did a lot damage to the military because there was uh, at a certain stage when there was no confidence between uh, tribes, even within the barracks, suspicion, mm. high level suspicion. Was it an Igbo coup? At that time? The Zogu coup, was it an Igbo coup? Well, uh, we, I will see it so. I will see it so. Why? Because he led the coup and he never denied it. But what, does that make it an Igbo coup? It, well, we think those people who planned it together and made him the leader. They believe we can do better than the rest of them and they can lead and they consider the leadership to him. So, Nziogu, 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 Kadna Nziogu. So, whose name are you going to mention again? But there were some Yorubas. They were some, in some Yorubas. They are, they are names are under the carpet. They were not pronounced as Nziogu. So, which name were you going to will you manufacture? So, the counter coup was the House of Fulani coup? The counter like coup. coup came up as a revenge. And it was bloody. It was then bloody. Bloody in the sense that the reason for the first coup was not clearly, or people refused to understand. Is that they refused to understand it? Or they understand it, but they don't want to believe that was the reason. So it was bloody to the point that uh, many people lost their lives. Ibu officers were killed in the barracks. Officers were killed in the barracks. My officer, my own officer, my own plateau commander, a Ibu man, his senior, another Ibu man, the third one who used to be in that hierarchy was for what they call a Kwaibon today. They were all killed in Abe Okutadia. And I can mention their name. There is need for that. Please go ahead. Anifuru. John Ubienu. Upon Usong. They were all killed. In Abekuta here. Because I was posted from Kaduna to Abe, to Abe Kuta as an editor. Because I've just returned from instructor's course in England to train people on tanks, on armored car. So during the first coup, you yes. were in Kaduna? I was in Kaduna. During the second coup, you were in Abiyokuta? No, during the second coup, I was in Abiyokuta. I was in Abiyokuta. Just for a short period to train uh, a tank crew. To train the tank crew. And I went back immediately after the training as an instructor. In fact, I was chief instructor at the same time.
State Affairs with Edmondo Bilo is live. Yes, speaking there with Major Razaki Salau, retired, taking us into the military. You see the power of history? Never underrate the power of history. You see, the future is always determined by the past. But it gets to a point if people decide if they want to break away from the maladies of the past and advance in a new direction into the future. The Nigeria I see at the moment is not ready to take a new part into the future. Perhaps young persons can break away from the past and they have the opportunity to show what they want in the 2020s. I tell every young person the ball is in your court. What are the nuts you are driving? But it cannot be a total break away from the past. Because the question of ethnicity is always there. It is prominent. Even in the United Kingdom, they still talk about the English, the Scots, the Welsh. If you go to different parts of the world, the issues of ethnicity remain. But in their own case, good governance is on top. Why these issues of ethnicity have become secondary issues? The ball is to, to, to decide the direction we want to take. I come again with a book that you should read. The General of the People's Army. The General of the People's Army. A book edited by Chuks Ilwebunam. Chuks Ilwebunam, the People's Army, is a, the, the General of the People's Army is about Odumegu, Ojuku. You want to read this book? Go on udarabooks.com and you would find this book. It's the same author as it runs the Nigeria Army. It runs in Nigeria, the Army, Power and Politics. You need to read these books if you like political analysis. Be a great political analyst. I read these books. I have these books. I spend day and night researching into these works. Join us and grow political discourse. We provide you political books on our store, udarabooks.com. It's an online store. And remember, you can also listen to us on stateaffairsng.com. If you go on that store, you can contribute to our research and production. If you go on stateaffairs.com, that website, you can contribute to what we do, our research and investigative journalism. And how do you do that? Just buy some books. If you go there, you will see an icon directing you on what do. Stateaffairsng.com And you can listen on that same website. You can see we are taking state affairs to every platform as possible. So join us and develop our broadcast. Soldiers of Fortune. This is a classic. Soldiers of Fortune by Max Yulin. Are you not reading this book? So just of Fortune, it's available on udarabooks.com. Go on the store for these books that I've recommended to you. They will open you to new ideas and they will open you to history. The leaders of the future are great readers. One reason Nigeria is poor is because our leaders are mentally poor. Books have a way of revealing what you don't know. As we coast home on this edition of State Affairs, I need to tell you at this point 
that the names that executed the counter coup of July 1967, 1966 rather, are Lieutenant Colonel Mortala Muhammad, Theophilus Danjuma, Martin Adamu, and Shitu Alao. What about Musa Usman, Joe Gaba? Where was Muhammad Buhari at that time, Ibrahim Babangida? I am not done with the military. This is just the beginning. How do you wear uh, the wear at the time? When these officers succeeded with their coup to the resistance of Ujuku, they wanted the northern region to break away from Nigeria. They wanted to break away after the July coup so that they can have their own country. They demanded for secession. Maxiolun in the book, or politics, we don't have that book at this time on Udara books, but you can find it if you can. The book is scarce. So Max Yolun in the book Oil Politics and Violence said, Ogundikwe, in a telephone conversation with Ujuku, made Ujuku to know that northern officers wanted to break away from Nigeria. The officers, improving the urgency of their demand, hijacked a British VC-10 plane bound for London. The plane flew the families of the mutineers to Kanu from Lagos in preparation for a declaration of independence from Nigeria. The mutineers gave northerners in Lagos 40 hours to leave Lagos and return to the north. How the table turned that the same northern officers fought Ojuku tirelessly to keep Nigeria won. Here is the study. Of history. Mortala Muhammad, the leader of the hardliners at the time, and his co travelers were convinced by northern intellectuals and the British government not to undertake the mission of secession. They were told, Now you have the whole country on your palm. Why do you want to break it? Why not take it over and enjoy yourself? So the officers would later rally round Gowon to consolidate their leadership, having seen the need to remain in the entity called Nigeria. This was welcomed in the north, victory for the people. And that was the consolidation of northern hegemony on the rest of the country. It was celebrated leading to deadly attacks on southerners living in the north. This was the same feeling that greeted the ascendancy to power of Mortala Muhammad. It was hoped that the Kopis would build a great country. In December 1975, United States Secretary of State Henry Kinsinger called on Nigeria to rally round other African countries to stop the takeover of Angola by MPLA and support the United States favored UNITA. Mortala Mohammed as head of state on the 6th of January 1976 replied to the United States saying that Africa has come of age and should no longer be dictated to. That was Mortala Mohammed confronting the American government. Yakubu Gowan had been overthrown. Olushegu Obansunjo was the second in command to Mortala Muhammad. Mortala Muhammad was killed on Friday, 13th February 1976, in a coup led by Colonel Buka Sukadinka. At Mortala's assassination, the mantle of leadership fell on Lucia Gunwa Basanjo, the Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters. Who was Mortala Muhammad? Let's listen to Jumoke Ugunkedi. He talks about Mortala Muhammad. And after this brief interview, 
we'll be rounding up this edition of the military in politics this is the first part i'm taking you down history lane knowledge is power listen to jumoke ugunkeri in your book Rule. Definitely. The same Murtala Muhammad? The same Murtala Muhammad. Uh, because uh, example is when uh, Chivenaro uh, was sent as head of delegation to London to source funding for the Biafran war. And uh, when they were in the presence of the Prime Minister, I think Harold Wilson, uh, he said, Britain will not support the war in Nigeria as is. And they asked him why. He said, because your generals are killing children in the war front. Chivenaro said, he asked him, do you have any proof? He said, Dara Wilson opened his drawer, brought out some pictures. The head of uh, Muritala Muhammad and his cohorts put guns to the head of 12, 13 year old boys, killing them. But he was known to be ruthless though. Yes. Especially during the second coup. The yes, counter coup. Yes, and that's why the man said, we will not give you money until you tell your generals in the war front to stop killing children. And when Enahoro came back to when Nigeria and reported came, to the military council? Yeah, yeah Chief Enahoro saw Joseph Akinwale way as his mentor, his godfather, his big brother. Uh, gave him a not unofficial report of the, joy of the trip and wondered uh, how he should present it at the, the Supreme Military Council. And Joseph Akinla Walewe, who was the head of the Navy then, just told uh, Chivenaro, why don't you discuss with your leader first? That leader was Chivaolawo. And he said he discussed with Awolawo, and Chivaolo said, present it as is. During the next military country, when you have to make your report about your trip to Britain. On presenting it, he had to now back it up with the pictures. Gawa was the head of state. Muritala Muhammad was part of the Supreme Military Council at a point in time. Muritala Muhammad stood up and started banging on the table. Who are you talking about, you bloody civilian? At that time, he talked with a harsh and strong voice. The one could not control him. The one admitted that he was the most difficult to control. Because they brought him to power. Because they, yes, they brought him to power. Gowan wasn't part of the coup. No. Gawan it was Muritala Muhammad and Co. Yeah, it was because they didn't know who should take over amongst the core northerners that they said, let's use uh, this uh, gentleman, this young man. And he could not control them. He could not. So and they, they finally to... booted him out in 1975. They did. They had to bring Gawan in from who was at that time almost approaching Ghana to oh, head the, the Nigerian system. Also, when he said that, I will now now uh, whisper to Gawan, please control your man. But Gawan could not. At that time, Awolo stood up and walked out of that meeting, followed by his uh, uh, group. And Aro and the rest of them followed suit. And so Gawan went and appealed to Awolo to come back and said, no, we will not come back unless you are able to tame the, this your shrewd. You must tame him. And he confessed to Awolo, it's difficult to, 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 to tame him. Then he said, then talk to whoever can tell me. I will not come back. So, Gawan had to talk to the emirs, who like, was, were like demigods at that time, and they told him to pipe low. And that was, they moved him out of uh, uh, Lagos. And so Gawan was able to come, uh, go back to what he was doing. And he dealt with Enauru in his own way. When he and became head of state, he seized Enauru's house. He was, he went to our uh, Naro's house and took away the, 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 the <laughs> generators and things like that. I said, to spite him. And uh, if not for the MS, he probably would have uh, uh, had uh, Chivenaro killed or kidnapped or jailed or something. State Affairs with Edmond Obilo is live. Reading is feeding the mind. Feed the mind. Go to udarabooks.com. Udara Books. Feeding the mind.
Yes, we have come to the end of this edition of State Affairs. If you enjoyed this broadcast, please share. Let others also enjoy it. Take it to the world. I will call this part one of military in politics. And a part two will come. And I have read different books. I have listened to different persons. I have different interviews to give you this package. Some of the books I have read to give you this package are Then Spoke the Thunder by Peter Enahuru. You heard Jumoke Ogunkeyede there, Otumba Ogunkeyede, talking about Anthony Enahuru. Peter Enahuru is the younger brother of Anthony Enahuru. If you read this book, Then Spoke the Thunder, you would understand what is going on in Nigeria of the moment. And you'll be able to make some of the permutations that will lead to a new leadership for Nigeria. Is ethnicity negative? I don't think so. It is always there. You can make it positive. The ball is always in our court. And if you read this book, it will give you detailed history of what happened during the time. Then spoke the thunder. I've also told you about this book, What Britain Did to Nigeria. You will find these books on udarabooks.com. Udarabooks.com. Go on that online store, our online store, and support what we are doing. Buy this book and support yourself. Another book I recommended to you today is Soldiers of Fortune. from Buhari to Babangida. I did not discuss that today, but I will discuss that in part two. And you can now understand how powerful this book is. It's a hardcover book, Soldiers of Fortune. You will find it on udarabooks.com. I also talked about General of the People's Army. This is Odumegu Ojuku. You need to read about this man. <laughs> there are things fascinating about him. And in reading this work, you would know why Ojuku is celebrated in the East. Is Peter will be the next great Igbo leader to emerge? The result of the 2023 elections will tell us. Will he be the next president of Nigeria? Does Labour Party have what it takes to beat APC and PDP in the poll? Okay, I have a book for you to read. Then the last book we featured today is Iransi, Nigeria, the Army, Power and Politics. Hey, you should be reading this work. Go on udarabooks.com. Get your copy. Now, come to our studio. Prodigy Studios. If you come to Prodigy Studios, you get the best photography, the best video documentary. You want to cover your events, weddings, conferences? Call us. Call Prodigy Studios. We have the tools. Yeah, me Prodigy is sitting in front of me as I speak. He has laptops in front of him. He has a console. There are cameras and lights here. That is Yami Prodigy. He is a video man. How can you find the Prodigy Studios? Come to Akala Express. After NMPC petrol station. After that roundabout, just drive down very close to a Larry Hotel and you will see the studios. Then come in, tell us what you want. You want to call the Prodigy Studios? Prodigy Studios, call the number 080-70-739-770. You can also call 080 
62245. I'll be sharing the graphics after this show so that you can get the details. You just see it on top of this video. Thank you for being there. Remember, if you enjoyed the show, share the video so that others can also enjoy the show. I'll be back soon. I am Edmondo Bilo. I worked with Yemi Faturuti, the one we call Yemi Prodigy. And my daughter is here looking at me. So I also worked with her. Hello, daughter. Aha, uh -huh, you can hear her voice. She's here helping out. Perhaps she's going to be your below that will take over from me. So you are enjoying the show, right? Yes. Okay, good. She contributed a lot to the production. She wants to show her face, but I'm saying, no, don't show your face yet. When it's your time, you show your face. But she's following her papa, watching what is going on. Thank you for being there. I am Edmondo Bilo. Reading is feeding the mind. Feed the mind. Go to udarabooks.com. Udara Books, feeding the mind.